So, I've, I made a sewing machine, um, not the one you see there, but a different one. And uh, it took forever, and I made a replica of my mother's. My mother was a quilter. I made a replica of her sewing machine, uh, 1956 Singer Whip sewing machine. And uh, it was very, very popular. Like, it, people really liked it. It was, it was probably the coolest thing I'd ever made to that point. And um, it got the attention of kind of a gallery that I really, really always loved and wanted, wanted to be in. And they asked if they could carry it. And I was so excited. And before I could deliver it, somebody bought it, which is even better. But then I realized, like, I didn't have a piece for this gallery. So they said that that was fine. They wanted another sewing machine. Because they, they had two shows they wanted to be in. They, 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 show for the sewing machine, and then they were doing a subculture show in Miami at Art Basel because this pipe thing had become this subculture underground hit. So as contemporary art is kind of getting interested in it. And so they wanted a, a pipe for their subculture show, and they wanted a sewing machine for their regular show. And I told them, that those sewing machines take 300 hours to make. So I have time to make one piece. But I want to be, I would rather be in the subculture show. And they said, well, we would rather have you in the other show. But said, well, the only way around this is I'm going to make the sewing machine bomb so you can use it for both shows. Um, and they said, sounds good. <laughs> so that's how that came to be. Has anybody used it? I don't, I don't know, but <laughs> somebody bought it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 like a, like a water pipe. Yeah. Drug paraphernalia, yeah. <laughs> so, this is where... This is actually just where the story starts about this model. Because then, it didn't sell at any of those shows, so I got it back. And I was at a, a... I had a residency at an art school in North Carolina. At Penland School of Crafts. And, um, they do this wonderful auction every year with, that supports their school. And all these major museums, curators, and collectors come in. And, um, and they raise you know, close to a million dollars at this auction to support that school. And as, as one of the resident artists, it's the major perk of that residency is that those collectors come through your studio one morning of that auction weekend. And anything you sell, you get to keep 100% of to help you make new work. And so, I had had this, I just got this back from the show, but it was ridiculously expensive. In fact, I didn't really know what price to put on it, because something takes that long, and you don't sell work in that calorie. It's really hard to figure out what to price it. So I put this price tag on it, I put $40,000 on it as a, I don't know, all I know is that I put so much work into it, I think this is what I, because like a calorie takes 50%, the government takes 30% of that, and so you start adding it up and you're like, that gets, I don't know. So I'm just going to put a price on it where nobody wants to buy it, so I don't have to feel weird about it. And um, during this auction, during this event, I I'm, I'm, have a bunch of, bunch of less expensive things that I'm actually selling pretty well. And I'm making a sale, and uh, this gentleman comes up and he says, you really need to go talk to that woman about your sewing machine. Because I put a little sign on it that didn't even have a price. I said, just ask me if you have a machine nothing else was priced anywhere near that, I thought it might look weird. And so I walk over and she says, uh, she's, uh, it's a high table, probably a little higher than this, and she's about four foot eight. And so she's got her elbow standing straight up, her elbows are on the table, and she's just looking at this thing. And uh, she looks over at me, she's in her mid 80s, she looks over at me. And her mid 80s? Yeah. And uh, oh, I have pictures of her, and she is amazing. So I don't know what this is about. But I walk over and I said, do you have a couple questions about this? I'd be happy to answer them. She says that. Without really taking her eyes off of the piece, looking at me, she says, what are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I told her. And then she kind of looks over at me, squints her eyes, and then looks right back at the piece. And doesn't say anything. And I'm a little complete. Talk to some other people. I'll come back if you have more questions. So I do that. The same guy comes over to me and says, you need to get back over there right now and talk to her about the story. And she's like, all right. So, nice. like, help so I said, uh, I go back over and was like, can I have another question? Can you do better? And she's like, you know, 
trying to make make a deal on this thing, and I'm in my head, I'm like, is she really serious? And so I I start giving her that spiel of collector's discount. And typically, for the right collector, I give a discount, and she just interrupts me because she can tell I'm just taking way too long. She's like, will you take 35? <laughs> and I've never sold anything for this amount of money in my life, and so I'm just my jaws. I'm, I'm like, yeah. Now I'm just trying to figure out what's the appropriate amount of time to wait before I pick her up off the ground. And shake her <laughs> yes, yeah. And in that time period, she says, uh, "If it helps, it's going to a museum someday." And that I barely even registered that because I'm already she jumped and she jumped up and down in my head. So I say, "Yes, it's yours," you know. And she pulls a folded up personal check out of her back pocket and writes out. Oh, and, and I'm still going like. Is this real? Is this woman? Is this, you know? And uh, she says, well, how are you going to deliver it? And my residency was over, which meant most of my studio was packed up. I didn't have anything to do for a couple weeks. And she lived in Washington, D.C., uh, which was about a seven-hour drive from where I was. So I was like, this is perfect. I will drive it to you, and I'll hang out in D.C. for a couple days and check out some museums. And um, it'll be, it's kind of perfect timing. And she says, great. So anyway, time comes to go up there. Her, her son, who was that guy that told me I better go talk to this woman? He was in his 60s. Uh, calls me up, kind of finalizing the time I'm going to be there and everything. And uh, he's like, well, you know, when you come in, where are you staying? I tell him I'm, gonna, I'm about to book a hotel in downtown D.C. And, uh, and he says, I don't think my mother's going to be okay with that. Let me call you right back. And he calls me back and he says, uh, yeah, I mean, you're staying with my mother at her apartment. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, please, that's not necessary. I, um, I, uh, I'll, I'll get a hotel. And he laughs. And he's like, she insists. <laughs> and I was like, really? I don't want to put her out. And he laughs again. He says, it's an 8,000 square foot, seven bedroom apartment. You'll have your own wing. <laughs> and so now I'm kind of like, who is this? What's going on? So I show up. So there's the doorman who's like, who the heck are you? Because I've got like three years in this residency here. So I've got this moppy hair, kind of like walking in in flip-flops. Like, what's going on? And he says, who are you here to see? And I tell him, and he's like, oh, you're Micah. And I said, yeah, it's the 17th floor. There's the elevator. So then I go and I get to the elevator and I walk back. I said, yeah, I'm, what room? He was like, it's 17th floor, man. Just go up. <laughs> So I show up, and they she, they bought whole penthouses and just knocked down the wall. So it's the whole top floor of this place. And I walk in, and one side is Grandma's house, like wicker furniture, knickknacks, and family photos. And the other side is this contemporary craft museum that I walk in and I start to look around, and I've I've noticed right away four out of the five pieces I I saw of the sculptures. Not only did I know the, the artist, but I knew that piece. Like, it was like a pinnacle piece in their career, right? It was just like, and I start to like, well, what is, who is this? What's going on? And she has me take the sewing machine out and put it on a table of this artist that I know that this table was probably a quarter million dollars. And anyway, she starts, we start talking. I'm getting nervous now. <laughs> and, um, she says, you know, it's too bad you didn't come a couple weeks earlier, a couple weeks later, because the Renwick is closed for renovation. And the Renwick is the Smithsonian, the contemporary craft wing of the Smithsonian. And then she says, nonchalantly, but I mean, the cool part is when it when it reopens, one of the new rooms has my name on it, and that's where this collection's going. And that's where your sewing machine's going. <laughs> right? And then that's when I realized I never told her it was a bomb. And now I have to figure out a way to tell this woman she bought a bomb. Because if you donate a piece to the Smithsonian, like they, there's a certain inspection process they go through, and they're going to be like, "Why do these little pieces come out?" Like there are ways I had to hide it being a pipe, and so I had these pieces that fit into these holes that would make it a functional pipe, but they would hide it if it was not. And realized I never told her that, and that whole chaos of that show, and, and now I really felt obligated to do that, and. I also had spent some of that money and realized that <laughs> I really needed her to be okay with this because I, I had the money to give it back to her, but that would kind of leave me in a rough spot because I was leaving that residency trying to move back to Austin. And so 
now I'm freaking out. I'm like trying to figure out how to how to tell her that um, and how she would handle it. She's really great. Um, but I didn't know. And so we were out, she took me to dinner, and um, halfway through dinner, she asked me how I got started in, in glass, the question you just asked, you know. And I told her about pipes, and I started out making pipes, and um, that was kind of the best thing that happened to me because it made me take a lot of things more seriously, and, and how the pipes evolved into art, and then the art then helped me make more interesting pipes, and I'm going back and forth, back and forth, and kind of explaining. She's really interested. She's listening. She interrupts me and says, like, she normally collects wood, like turned wood, late turned wood, and um, one of her artists she's collected for 40 years. Back when she says her, her budget for buying art was $30, you know. She says, I was to buy his work for $30 40 years ago, and now I, I buy it for $40,000. He's a good friend of mine, and I was at his studio, and he had this display case of all these sculptures I'd never seen. And he told me back when, you know, over the years when he had a hard time making ends meet, he would make bombs uh, out of wood and sell them to his friends and stuff. And she says, I thought they were gorgeous, and so he gave me one. So she says, I have one bomb in my collection. And I said, actually, for you have two. Because the sewing machine's a bomb, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and she, uh, she had a bite of food like on the way to her mouth, and it stopped. <laughs> and she turns her head, and her eyes get real narrow, and now my heart just sinks, and I just start rattling off, like about the show, about why it was, about why that's great, you know, why, why it's really cool. And um, God. she takes that bite of food and she chews it. And it's just like the longest two seconds of my life, you know? And she swallows it, she looks me in the eye and she says, I got a wooden dildo too. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the last thing she said about it. She was fine, it was, it was great. Yeah. She sounds phenomenal. She is phenomenal. And so she, um, she, um, she does a lot of fundraising stuff for the Renwick, the Smithsonian. And when she gives her talks at fundraising events, she tells that story as her closer. Um, but she leaves the dildo part out. But she, she, she finishes it with, I didn't know, quite know what to think, but my grandkids are really excited to come over and visit grandma. And it's true, they tag me on Instagram all the time about, I can't believe grandma bought this. It was surreal. Um, but it was really cool. She was an amazing woman and, um, that the, the collection was phenomenal and then you know going through she, she told me such amazing stories about less about life but um, you know that was one of those interesting ways money comes about you know they kind of started with nothing and, and built it built up this she really made you feel relaxed yeah it was I never would have guessed that this this person was who they were and that and that what they what they end up doing with their money is really good stuff and, um, and then you know going through grandma's house and noticing like the family pictures you know and then we're walking walking down the hall and I'm kind of barely looking at the family photos and then I stop and kind of go two photos back and start going slower and it's her and her husband with hanging out not like photo op but hanging out with every president back to Canada <laughs> and I'm like who are you what is going on and they just lived in that area, and um, construction and real estate. I still don't know what that means, but <laughs> when I do, it's more of the scale of who makes you know, the skyscrapers and that kind of stuff. But it was just, you never know who you're going to be when. And I loved it because there was no reason. Sometimes at that scale, art is an investment as much as it is something they like to have. And there was no reason for her to think that that was it. She liked the piece, you know, because I didn't have I didn't have a resume. I didn't have a resume that would suggest that that would be a, a you know a good investment in the future. So that I like um, that seems to be rarer and rarer at that scale of, of collecting artwork. So it was really. Have you ever made any? Um, have you ever made another piece of that 
Um, I've made a couple of pieces, not, you know, that was the only one that kind of crossed over into that other world, but I've made a couple of, of uh, those sewing machines like that. They take so long to make, they, I mean, it really took 300 hours, um, that it's hard to, at a certain point, you'll, if you can't work on it for a consistent amount of time, you lose momentum with it, and it's hard to get back to it, you know, so, um, I don't have the opportunity to, but that's a, something I'm hoping to be able to start something of that magnitude again soon. Is there water? Oh, and the, and the pink one? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the Okay, so you can't really see it, but right under here you can notice this. There's this weird, it's not quite the same as the little piece of yeah. There's a, a hollow clear part, a barrel that's hidden behind this. And now you see this black line that goes all the way through here. This is the mouthpiece, this little ball comes back. Oh my oh. god, with all the others. And then this is, the, this is where the business goes, right? And so that comes out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so this this is a black thing, it's all hollow in here in the function. And there's this little clear spot here that water can drain back down. And and so there was an interior kind of mechanism to this that was honestly the hardest thing to, to engineer was the, the hidden infrastructure behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so not only just the, the exterior, that, that was pretty, pretty interesting to make but in, in a feat in itself, but then to hide everything in it and to have it work. I'm surprised that I pulled it off, but I'm kind of glad it probably works really poorly. Uh, so I'm glad she bought it. Cause... When you were making it, did you make it with the intentions of making it a bomb? I mean, I knew I had to make it do both to qualify for both of these shows, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. I, mean, I knew there was a way to do it, and um, but I picked a machine that that I thought was beautiful. The first, the singer sewing machine I made wasn't. A bong, but it was just a replica, and that I, it was my mother's machine. I had a reason to make it, and so the second one I did, I didn't really have a, a larger reason to make it other than to qualify for these shows. So I just picked a an object that was really interesting. Um, when you go through the steps of making a replica, you have to kind of go through the same steps that the guy that designed it went through to make it. You start to understand why they made these decisions. And where there were opportunities to make it beautiful and where there weren't, where they had to make it function and stuff. So it's, it was really valuable. Um, and this, there were a lot of opportunities because it was so flowing and curving and there were a lot of opportunities to, to hide things. Uh, and while still not, not screwing with the, the exterior. Uh, it was really fun. And I'll never do it again. You start, you still in school, right? No, I never really, it's funny, I mean, I, that residency was, uh, so there's a couple ways residencies work, and this one was, uh, it was a long residency, it was four years, three years, and so uh, it's this school that, um, it's a craft school, so they do about two week programs in the summer, spring and fall, spring and fall they do a two month class, and in the summers they do two week classes. And the way kind of craft and glass blowing and other and ceramics and weaving and all these things is there's not really a great university program where you can take a lot of these things. And a lot of times, people that are very successful at them aren't exactly teaching in a university situation. They're making stuff in their studio. And so these schools like Penland and there's Pilchuck, there's a, there's a bunch of them all over the country, but it's a place you can come and study with a master for two weeks and it, for, from dawn till midnight. Um, and, and you live on the campus and everything. Um, you know, very intense. You have constant contact with this instructor for you know, 18 hours a day, two weeks straight. And so you can get a, a year's worth of college experience in two weeks because you're not taking a class three days a week with one hour, uh, and you might get to talk to the instructor. You know? So they're really it's an intensive way of learning. And that residency, they gave me a studio and an apartment and meals for three years. And all I had to do was make whatever I wanted. I had no obligation to teach. I had nothing to do except make work. Yeah, you had to pay for your normal studio expenses, 
but they supplemented that. And so that kind of residency is geared towards working artists that are already making some money that want to change directions, right? It's hard to, even if you're a working artist, it's hard to have the time to experiment on new things because you're always trying to pay that electric bill. And so you see, a lot of times you get stuck making just things you know will pay the bills and then you experiment when you have the time. It's hard to build enough momentum to change and stuff. So I got really lucky and, and received that, that residency. So that's the only reason I had the time to make a 300 hour sewing machine. Um, and uh, man, I, I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that residency. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah, and was he doing this type of glass blowing? Yeah. No, he was doing animals. He was doing everything. Yeah. Man, it's funny. Some of my earliest memories are those kind of boardwalk uh, flame workers, these glass blowers. I went to Disneyland in, in Southern California when I, this must have been the, the early '80s or late '70s. When it was one of my first memories, and they. They could not get me out of the little flame where the guy was making them goofy. They couldn't get me out of there to go ride roller coasters. And they were like, we couldn't understand what was wrong with you. Because you wouldn't leave the gift shop to go meet, you know, Mickey Mouse. I put a picture on the screen of the Singer sewing machine that he made. And that's a little larger than life, so that's... That's about a one-third enlargement from the actual machine. My mom, my mom was a nurse, that, but I remember her as a quilter. Because I didn't go to work with her. I was just around her when she was home. And at night, she would be making quilts. It's like her, I inherited that from my mom where I have to keep my hands moving, otherwise I go crazy. And so she would always have a quilt that she was working on. And uh, when uh, it was, uh, she never had the time when, I was, when we were younger, once the kids got to a certain age where we were kind of running around ourselves after school and she had a little more time to think, she started quilting again. And my father, one Christmas, she was opening a present and he had bought her a Singer sewing machine from the 50s. And uh, I was still young enough to not understand why she started crying, you know. I thought she was angry that my father bought her a shitty old sewing machine. And really, it was the machine her grandmother taught her to sew on. Not the machine, but the same model. And he had paid attention enough to like remember that and narrow it down. And like they were going through an antique store once, and she mentioned that. And then it took him a while to track down one that worked. But it was the first time I kind of really understood what sentimentality was. Right? And then as I got older and started to have those same kind of memories and feelings about my youth or my family, I started to make this work because this type of sculpture. When you spend 300 hours on something, you those little details of, of memories that start to get foggy, they, they come back, you know, and they, they're cemented again. And so the, the to topographical maps, that sewing machine, the way they're objects, but they're also ways for me to cement those, those stories and those memories that are special and want to keep around. I'm running out of good stories. Oh, you did well. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Um, <laughs> so um, I also found that I I do I use the sculptures. I do a lot better not having to sell them, and not even I don't necessarily try a whole lot. Um, and so I have a I have a, another job. Well, for a while it was kind of craft stuff, meaning like the, either the pipes still, or um, I do these kind of decanters and bottles, things that are, that fulfill another side of what I love to do, which is design. But they're a little more attainable for everybody, and, and, and it's a better market for them than a sewing machine, you know. Um, and that finances the things that I, the sculptures. And then, they, it seems to me, for myself at least, it's, Things work a lot better when I, when I don't have to think about the destination or the time frame on making them, where they're going or how much they'll sell for, which doesn't necessarily fit into how galleries like to work. And so there's, I don't really deal with a whole lot of galleries. I 
you know, deal with social media. So I sell a lot of things through Instagram. And, um, directly to collector, which is kind of the new way things are heading, is that instead of having to go to a gallery to, to, to find artists you like, you find them on the other side of the planet on your phone, and, and then you're interacting with them directly. And so it's kind of cutting out this middleman, which is really hard for a gallery structure now, is trying to figure out how to remain relevant in a world where people are going around what you normally, the service you normally provide. So it's good for artists right now because we're in, we're in control of where our work is going and who's seeing it. But also now we're doing all the business side of things that we are not good at. So it's this double-edged sword. Um, so right now I don't have a place where you can go see my stuff. Number one, I don't make a lot of it because it takes so long. And, um, but um, and number two, it's just I don't have a... I'm in this middle ground of I'm not exactly following the format that galleries have been used to over the last ever since they've been galleries. But. So when you don't produce work in series, you don't produce a lot of it. It's it's hard to, to get the attention of those places. Now, where do you live? Do you live I live in Austin, Texas, right now. Austin. Yeah. Yeah. I moved to to Austin. That's another story. I fell in love with a flight attendant in Reno and ended up in Austin um, about 12 years ago. We're, we're part of Austin. I've got five sons. And yeah. There all the time. Yeah, I live actually pretty much downtown, just okay. east of downtown on Cesar Chavez. Okay. Yep. Um, Austin's a great, for me, it was the perfect blend of kind of that music culture of Seattle where I went to college, you know, and um, more of a climate that isn't raining. It's a, it has, it's one of those cities, un, not unlike this in Norfolk, is that it has a personality that is, seems to be on individuals. What's that? No, I'm just here for the weekend, or for the four days here doing this little um, visiting artist. Um, I was lucky enough to be invited to do this, and this is an amazing facility. And the museum is unbelievable. I was floored at the collection, the staff. I mean, this is this is really rare. I've never really seen something as well organized and, and um, well put together as this. I've always heard rumblings of it, but uh, I, I'm embarrassed that it took me this long to come down here and figure that out. So I'm really excited that I got to come here. So I'm just putting together these little little balls and then um, hopefully it won't be too much longer. I try to do all this prep uh, in the morning so between noon and in the afternoon, I get to actually sculpting that bird. I learned some, this is a new, I'm trying to put this pattern in this bird. Normally I make them clear. Um, and so this is something I'm new. So yesterday I made one and I'm uh, kind of learning from the things that went really well in that one and things that didn't. And I'm gonna try it one more time and see if I can get this pattern to read a little bit more like a topography. Oh. I think it's, you know, it's, I just, I got lucky in that I fell into, or you know, rather, I didn't start working with glass till I was 24. But I, I managed to find something while I was relatively young that was a passion and I knew I would be happy doing every day. And the first 15 years were really hard. Um, as it is with anything, like, I mean, it's not just art, anything. Yeah, and um, so, yeah, I also think it's more of a disorder than an art form, you know? It's, it's that, Glass tends to, a lot of the people here and anybody that's worked with it, it's, it starts to take over 
uh, your thoughts, you know, it's just such a foreign substance, it doesn't work like anything else on the 